So hey, it's Jordan, Ancient Literature Dude, back to ramble with you once again. And today I wanted to talk about one of my favorite books, the classic and early work of vampire fiction, Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fontenu. And as I said, it's an early uh, vampire novella, and it isn't as well known as Dracula, which I think is unfortunate because in my personal view, it's better. Uh, it was a huge influence on Dracula, which is widely recognized, and it's still well known in its own right, but I think that more people should probably be aware of it. Uh, it's not only a good read, and a, and a, and a quick read, uh, but it's, I think, an interesting take on the whole vampire idea, especially for its time period. Uh, but if you're not familiar with it, the basic idea is that, first of all, the book is presented as a frame story, much like The Turn of the Screw, which uh, came a bit later and which it probably also influenced. Uh, the idea is that the book itself is an actual account and uh, it begins with notes by a Dr. Heselius, who is apparently a an investigator into the paranormal. Uh, and he, again, presents this this book and the narrative that follows as an actual case study, a, you know, a real life account. Uh, and uh, I imagine that especially for the time period, uh, but even on a modern read, it does make the book feel more real, more relatable. Uh, it adds to that horror element, the idea that, you know, this, this could actually have taken place. So the main story is about and narrated by Laura, this young woman living in Styria in what is present day Austria in a schloss, a kind of a small castle in this isolated countryside with her father. And as the story begins, she's expecting a visit from a young girl, a local girl who mysteriously dies. Lo and behold, of course, it turns out to be that she was the victim of a vampire. Then a strange figure winds up at, at her and her father's doorstep. And of course, this figure is Carmilla, uh, who is very strange, very mysterious, keeps odd hours, uh, seems to be very weak, to suffer herself from a, a kind of a strange illness, doesn't seem to eat. Her whereabouts can't be accounted for half the time. She goes missing during the night. Of course, to a modern audience, to a modern reader, a lot of this stuff seems fairly obvious, but uh, it has to be you know, taken into account that the whole vampire lore wasn't as well known at the time in terms of its particulars. Uh, there was still this kind of a fascination with the supernatural and the undead and these revenants that would kind of stalk in the night. And so all of the, the what we now take for granted as the, the modern you know, gist of it, the lore of it was all sort of uh, coalescing at the time and forming. But uh, in any event, uh, Carmilla in the end winds up forming a bond with Laura, uh, which is in itself very fascinating and, and can make a very good character study, but is ultimately revealed to be this uh, Countess, Karst uh, Countess Karnstein figure, uh, Mirkala, uh, this this woman who presumably had died years and years ago, but had obviously become a vampire. And they're finally able to re uncover her grave and, and deal with her once and for all. Uh, but in any event, that is the, the gist of the story. And so one of the reasons that I think Carmilla is a better book than Dracula is that Carmilla is a better character than Dracula. And what I mean by this is that Dracula arguably is not much of a real character at all. He's a kind of a, a type, right? He's a villain, very clearly a villain, almost super villainous. He lives in a dark, spooky castle and has these strange mannerisms and is very clearly a, a threat to anyone with any common sense. Whereas Carmilla presents herself as an anonymous young noblewoman and is almost like a common con woman. She infiltrates into the life of her victim, ultimately in order to devour and, and consume her victim's soul. Uh, but unlike in the case of the earlier young girl in the novella, Carmilla actually winds up developing feelings for Laura. And this relationship is very widely recognized 
in vampire fiction as being uh, the basis of the first lesbian vampire work of fiction. Uh, and deservedly so, because unlike Dracula, in which the sexuality is more explicit and more provocatively presented, uh, the sexual element in Carmilla is very subtle and very understated. It's the story of these two very real and very relatable young women who seem to be discovering their sexuality as if for the first time. Even Carmilla, who, as we find out, is this ages-old countess who has lived multiple lives, you almost develop a sympathy for her because she's trapped in a kind of a limbo. She is undying and has lived this facade over and over of uh, you know, presenting herself as a kind of an interested young woman to other interested young women, uh, awakening their kind of latent uh, homoerotic feelings and preying upon them. But as in the case of Laura, it seems that she's capable of herself falling into love. And so she's, again, almost sympathetic in being a predator against her own will. Uh, she's a kind of a tragic vampire. Uh, in my reading of the novel, at least, she has genuine feelings for Laura and seems to want to avoid uh, completely ending her, her current life, her mortal existence, as long as she can. Uh, she has a kind of a bizarre, almost perverse uh, admiration of her purity and innocence. And she even tells her uh, fairly early in the novel, I think in a very telling passage in chapter four, Dearest, your little heart is wounded. Think me not cruel because I obey the irresistible law of my strength and weakness. If your dear heart is wounded, my wild heart bleeds with yours. In the rapture of my enormous humiliation, I live in your warm life and you shall die, die, sweetly die into mine. I cannot help it. As I draw near to you, you in your turn will draw near to others and learn the rapture of their cruelty, which yet is love. So for a while, seek to know no more of me and mine, but trust me with all your loving spirit. And this can be seen as simply protecting her own predatory interests, right? But on another level, I think it can also be viewed as an actual expression of her love, her desire to maintain this relationship, however much of a facade it may be, however illusory it may be, because it has some hint of innocence and purity. It has that spark uh, to her and obviously to Laura. In some ways, it's very new and very real. And I think that's what's so beautiful and haunting and strange and sort of complex about the novel is that it examines the real and the very dangerous nature of love and the newness of love and of strangers and forming a bond with someone whom we don't yet truly know. And even in the end, uh, this is a very pronounced theme. Uh, we find that this nobleman who has ridded the village immediately to the west of Laura's home Karnstein, which bears her mother's ancestral name, uh, was himself a vampire killer, but uh, a bit of a complex one because he ridded the village of these vampires, but he left one who, of course, was Carmilla, whom he knew and loved as the Countess Mercala, the anagram of her name, to which she's apparently constrained. Uh, and I love that, that little detail because it's sort of like Alucard in, in Castlevania, right? It's an, it's an anagram of Dracula. I love that little, uh, you know, play on words. But uh, in any event, this poor fellow, this Moravian guy, uh, couldn't find it in his heart to kill his love. Uh, and there's a very neat detail about this in the uh, final chapter of the novel uh, where it says, he has left a curious paper to prove that the vampire, on its expulsion from its amphibious existence, is projected into a far more horrible life, and he resolved to save his once beloved Mercala from this. And so, uh, 
you have in the end this kind of a horrifying idea that as terrifying as the vampire's life is now in some kind of a supernatural or spiritual way this uh, expert on vampire life has confirmed proof that something even more horrible awaits them after death or their current existence uh, and that's another element of, of Carmilla I like that it has this uh, kind of a mystic view on uh, spirituality and uh, you know what it means for the human soul to become trapped in this undying uh, you know life of a vampire so in any event uh, I highly recommend the novel as I said uh, if you haven't read it I strongly urge you to go and check it out I think it's well worth the read if you've read Dracula in particular uh, whether you enjoy Dracula or not, I think that Carmilla is better and certainly different. It's rewarding in its own way. Uh, and uh, as I've said, I think it's underrated. I think it deserves to be more widely known and discussed uh, because I think it's much more subtle and more complex than its more well-known counterpart. And in any event, if you have read Dracula or, or have not, please share your comments please let me know what you think uh and please like share and subscribe if you enjoyed and uh in the meantime i will just ask you to as always take care and i will talk to you later